Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. I'm here again with Mike Summer. Mike and I, when we got started, we didn't know how long it would go. I figured it might take more than 15 minutes, and we just thought we're going to just go until we run out of tips. I actually don't think we did run out of tips, but we just thought this is long enough. If somebody writes in with something to him or to me, maybe we'll do something like this again. In the meantime, we're both enjoying the ComC service, and here are some hopefully helpful hacks, uh, some tips from our experience. I guess I'm a veteran now. I've been on there for a long time. He's been on there for a long time, too. So thanks at uh, Topps, Panini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, and for this episode especially, ComC.com. Uh, check it out. And when you do check it out, here's some good ideas from Mike and a few good ideas from me too. So enjoy. And uh, here is our discussion. One of the tips I have for people, especially if you want to do some flipping on the site, is switch your account into advanced reseller mode. That removes the automatic 25 cent handling fee assigned to every card and allows you to pick cards pretty cheap. One of my favorite things to do on the site is to flip penny cards for more than a penny. I will sometimes post a, a screenshot of, of something like that. People are always asking, how do you find a card for a penny? 26 or 28 cents is the cheapest that I'm seeing anything. And it's because you're not in advanced reseller mode. So you've got that 25 cent per card load already built in. So if you flip to advanced reseller mode, if you're going to do a lot of flipping, it allows you to buy and sell those and turn those cards over without that extra charge. And you just ultimately pay that 25 cents if you actually have a card shipped back to you. Right. So as long as you don't ship it back, you've got a penny. And for somebody to compete with you, they got to pay 50 cents to list it. You're obviously going to be the lowest person on the site, but you bought it at a penny. What do you mark it up to? 51 cents? That gets to the other strategy that I'll go ahead and share, even though I'll share it, even though it probably is somewhat to my detriment. But I do this a lot with some of the cards that are part of the EPAC program. I will buy those cards for a penny or two pennies. I'll buy as many as I can, and then I'll reprice them for about 38 or 39 cents, which I believe translates to about a dollar on eBay. That's the threshold for where it will hit that minimum listing price on eBay. The way it works is then if somebody buys it on eBay, whether I have it listed for three cents or whether I have it listed for 38 cents, they're still paying ComC a dollar for that card. I might as well keep that float for myself and take that chance to wait it out. And then if I'm buying enough of them, I'm buying enough inventory sometimes on those EPAC cards where I might own 60, 70% of the cards on the site. And I've bought enough of them and repriced them all up to that new 38 cent threshold. That's one of the ways that I've gone about that. So sometimes I've, it's a penny and I sell it for 38 cents. Sometimes I pay 20, 25 cents for it and sell it for 38 cents. But in the grand scheme of things, when you average it all out, it's done well for me over time. But you have to be patient. Yeah, but I, a patient at a penny, it's not like you got a lot in it. <laughs> and a lot of upside, obviously, other than the fact that it, it may not sell. It may just sit there. That's the, Not everything sells every month. But for people that are putting in or building up their inventory on Com C, it's 50 cents a card now, the cheapest to, to yep. put it in there. Is there a price card? Would you put a dollar card in? Would you pay 50 cents to list a card at a buck if you thought it would sell within some time frame? Typically, that is about the minimum that I look to submit at this point is, is about a buck. And I will, depending on what I've bought it at. Sometimes if I'm buying out a collection and my average cost on this collection is a couple pennies a card, I will go ahead and send it in to come see if it's something that I don't have a lot of traction for at the shop or I'm not going to be able to do much with because I figure my actual cost of the card is two or three cents. I'm going to pay 50 cents to get it listed. If I can sell it for a buck twenty-five, there's still enough, you know, room in there, enough profit for me. And in the long run, those extra quarters add up. Typically, that dollar is the the threshold I'm using when I send something in. Yeah. The other thing is when I'm getting ready to send something in, and I see that there's only one on the site, and it's at a quarter, then I could just buy it for a quarter instead of paying fifty cents to put another one in there and compete with the person at a quarter. Yep. Would you do you do the same thing? Would you just take the quarter? Yeah, I would typically do something like that if there's a card that's in that range. I, I was curious from your perspective, especially if you've got any kind of inventory, you might be priced competitively at one point, but a few months later, you might not be competitive anymore. Whether it's things that are going up or things that are coming down in price, do you have a strategy on how often you go through your inventory and adjust prices? 
Yeah, I was afraid of this when, when we were talking about doing this episode. You're going to give away some of your secrets. I'm going to give away some of mine. I'll tell you, Mike, when I do it is when somebody makes an offer. When they make an offer, that means I'm going to look at the offer and I'm going to say, wait a minute, I priced this card years ago. And that was an old price. It's really gone up. And they're making me an offer. And I feel like I'm, I'm way out of line. They should have just bought the card. And so one out of 10 cards or so, I'll wind up raising my price and declining the offer, which I think is my prerogative. I don't like doing it because I think it makes people mad. But that if, if it's a low price to try to get it a little bit cheaper is maybe not smart for them. Yeah, I hear you. But just combing through my cards, it's hard to do that. I probably have too many to do that, even in a systematic way. But if somebody brings attention of an insert set or a player that's gone up, I'll do it. The other problematic thing that you raised that I'd like you to speak to is that I don't really do sales, but a lot of people do. So some of the times I've priced my cards in line with a current sale that later is rescinded or expires. I've been matching a price or or competitive with a price that was half or some really drastic reduction. And I think, wait a minute, how did my price get so low? I was responding to that. So do you have that same thing? Or are you one of the sales guys? I don't run perpetual sales. I will usually take advantage of the free sale promotions that the site gives usually one or two times a year. And then maybe one or two other times a year, I will run a promotion just to try to clear some things out. They've adjusted that, the the cost or the commission fee and the fee structure for those promotions now um, to a point where I just don't want to do them all that often. You pay a little lower percentage, but there's a bigger upfront fee depending on how many cards you have. And I'm somewhere around 80,000 cards now in inventory. So it can add up a little bit to start with. It, It probably averages two or three promotions a year. You mentioned velocity of sales. That's one of the things if you use, I guess it's the history points, you can see how many cards have sold you know, by quarter in the last years or whatever it's been. Do you look at that a lot? Because I look at it some when I think it's appropriate, but if something is selling, none have sold in the last four years, that's an indicator. Yeah, I look at it quite a bit. I use that quite a bit to get a feel for both what I want to send in and then also where I need to price something at. If you're going to put a card on there and when you decided to put it on there, there were none of them on there. But say it's a newer player and uh, a newer set last year or two, and there was nothing on there. And then by the time you were posting it, there were two cards at, say, $2 and one at 50 cents. And you're convinced this is a $2 card. What do you do? Typically, I will go ahead and price that at probably somewhere around $1.90. When that super low sells, I'll be the next lowest on there, but I'll be real close to that $2 that I wanted to get out of it. Okay. I do that, but I also give strong consideration to buying the card at 50 cents. Sure. And moving it to a buck 90 or buck 80, buck 70, whatever. A buck 70 is a price I'm using a little more these days because when you add on the quarter, it's under two bucks. Yep. And I've seen people doing that. Yeah, that's something that I definitely do. If it was as drastic of an example as you just shared, where you'd be able to essentially triple your money on it, that is something that I would for sure do. You know, if it was listed at a buck 40 or a buck 50 and I wanted to be at $2, I might do that with a dollar 90. But yeah, if there's examples where it's just one card between me and that next floor, yeah, and it can be a, a double or a triple, that's definitely a good candidate for one to go ahead and buy the other one that's there and now two of that for inventory. The logic is if I was willing to pay 50 cents to list it, why wouldn't I be willing to pay 50 cents or less to acquire it and just move it over to my account? You talked about the using a dollar seventy a lot lately. Something else that I wanted to hit on or I think is important for people to know if they're not aware, when you're dealing with cards on the lower end, like we're discussing right now, is that there's a storage fee associated with holding cards that are priced above 75 cents with a basic account or above $2.50 with kind of the advanced um, upgraded account. I, I often will see people that have cards priced at 78 cents or 80 cents or something like that. And they're paying theoretically a penny a month in storage fees for those cards, unless they have that upgraded account or the same thing applies at $2.50. I was wondering how often 
that type of thing comes into play for your considerations or if you observe that same thing in other cards as you're you know scanning inventory that's out there okay you're just uncovering my secrets i will sort my inventory by the lowest price of those cards that are paying a storage fee and i'm looking because yeah, i pay 50 bucks a month to get the two dollar and fifty cent threshold i'm not going to have any cards at two dollars and fifty five cents i've seen them there but they're not mine or 260 or 265 there's no reason to because just in a few months you've lost your edge in fact at three bucks or 350 or four after you've been in there for a few years you're thinking if i did it at 250 i'm going to net the same thing so and you may have sold it already. And you, you may have been able to turn it over. Arguably wouldn't have sold it slower. So yeah, those are considerations. And I wonder what's going on. But then that's the beauty of Com C. It's very democratic in the sense that the seller can do what they want to do. The buyer can do what they want. Do you draw comfort from the fact that there's no messaging between anonymous buyers and anonymous sellers? You intentionally, I think, a name on there that's right. you know personified with you. Yep. So do people message you? and say, hey, cut me a break, because I get that sometimes. And the beauty of Comp C is that it is semi-anonymous if you want it to be. Yeah, there's pros and cons that come with that. I do have Wax Pack Hero as my username, and, and I try to keep that as consistent as, as possible, both for the, the content side and my sales side is just part of my overall brand. I haven't had a lot of people reach out specifically for items on Comp C, but I have on things I have listed on eBay or those other platforms there's part of me that likes that Comp C is a little bit independent of that. There's other times I know as a buyer that I found sellers that have multiple things that I'm interested in, but for some reason don't have offers turned on at all. There's a reason that I'd love to be able to have a conversation about obtaining multiple items from them. But at the end of the day, I think there's something nice about not necessarily having to also respond to messaging within the platform as well. The man that- 